I'll get started. Um, basically, we all sort of went through yeah, what you could call tool hell yesterday, installing quarters and simulators and everything. And someone asked, could it get any worse? Well, <laughs> yeah. Good um, no, no, seriously, uh, setting up all the tools you, you need for this sort of thing is another fairly sort of large task. I mean, it doesn't come all nicely bundled, the, the open risk stuff. You need a, you need essentially a software tool chain which you can download, pre-compile or compile yourself. If you compile yourself, you need like every single open source development tool and library under the sun, it seems. Um, the pre-compiled ones are a much better option, but we're a fairly small project and we don't really have someone who's dedicated to managing the release of tool chains and things like that. So it's kind of, you know, whoever was the last person who went to a conference like this who pre-compiled it and made a version available online is, is the most recent thing to have. Yeah, so, so that's one aspect of what you need to do is system on chip development. The other one is the, the few tools, so like the Cordis tools to talk to the FPGA board. Or if we had a Xilinx board, we, you would have had to have downloaded all the Xilinx stuff. Um, Icarus and GTKOX, so they're the tools which we use most for the verification. Or well, Icarus and Verilator that we use most in the open risk system on chip development. And GTKOX to, to look at the waves. Um, once you have a board on the design, uh, design on the board, uh, you need a way to talk to it. You need a way to sort of you know, as I said before, getting, tell the processor to stop, read and write registers and things like that. And that is the last tool I've asked you to install. So if anyone was successful doing all of that, you can play along, otherwise people, uh, all the instructions are here, you can play with it later on at home as well, and we're, on, we're online, you know, 20 hours a day, so you can come along and jump into IRC and ask us what's going on. Yes, you should say what the IRC channel Oh yeah, we all hang out in hash open risk on Freenode. Uh, so you're welcome to get on there now and idle and lurk and ask questions when you're running problems. We're more than happy to assist people. Or we have some mailing lists. If you go to opencourse.org slash OR1K, uh, you'll find all the information there. And there's information on the mailing lists and the IRC are in there too. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the system on chip that we use, that, that I use for development at the moment. Oh, that's what I see there. So if you're following along the wiki, I ask you to go into so uh, MOR1KX is the name of the CPU I've been developing for the last two years with another guy, Finnish guy, Stefan Christensen, or Stekern as his handle is in IRC. Um, it's a ground up re-implementation of an open risk processor. The idea is that if anyone here has used the Altera Neos, you get the option when you instantiated of having either like a small slow one, like a big fast one. That's sort of the thing we were going for here. So the, the MR1KX is very configurable and you can choose to have like a small lower power, slower implementation or you can have a big fully blown one with caches and MMUs and run Linux and things like that. So that's the idea of this project. We've been working on it for about two years. It's pretty stable, like all of the demos I'm running today will be on the, the processor. Um, so. As I said before, the processor itself is not so useful. You need like a development or a verification environment. I took OpSock and sort of forked it because uh, various reasons I wanted to customize it for my CPU. I probably shouldn't have done that in hindsight, but whatever. Um, so today we're using that verification environment, but it's, it's OpSock. Um, so I'll just go into the environment. And usually, you know, uh, that, You've got your, well, I'll do that again. Um, you know, a directory for your RTL modules, a directory for bits and pieces of software, and um, under boards is where you get like the systems, the actual instantiations which pull everything together, or the modules which pull everything together. Uh, we've got a category for every FPGA vendor here, Actel, Altera, Xilinx, or generic, and generic means it's like a, you know, not technology dependent. So we're going to generic, and there's an implementation for each sort of pipeline configuration. So we're going to MR1KX. Pronto Espresso is the name of the pipeline. 
There's three pipelines, cappuccino, espresso, and pronto espresso. So cappuccino is a full-blown one, it'll run your Linux. Espresso is a smaller one. Pronto espresso is even smaller. Um, it's, it's not got the delay slot on the jumps. So in open risk, if you hit a jump or a branch instruction, you will normally, typically, all the other pipelines will execute the instruction following the branch, whether you're going to take that branch or not. Uh, we got rid of that optionally, and the CPU pipeline, which doesn't execute branch delay slots, is the Pronto Espresso pipeline. So we're using that one today. Um, so if you go into a directory called sim run, I'm just following the wiki, by the way. Um, you go make RTL test. And that will do a bunch of stuff. That will compile software for the open risk. It will compile the Verilog for the open risk. It will then load up the design, you know, put the program in the memory so the CPU starts executing and it runs. And you get a little report there. This is kind of like an ASCII representation of uh, this is an ASCII representation of, I guess, good, right? A, zero, 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 D. And it's exited, and the exit code is zero, so usually, you know, no error, very good. So yeah, this is literally starting up the system, and taking it out of reset, compiled a program for the CPU to run, and it's all run. But obviously, as Jeremy pointed out before, you don't really get much out of the command line from these simulations. Uh, although that's good sometimes because you just want to run a bunch of tests. For instance, we have a regression suite that looks like this. If you just go make RTL tests, plural, it'll sit here and run a bunch of tests and just say, it'll print out some messages, but oh, this is just a little version check in the software. Um, so it'll finish that one and then it'll go on to the next one and it's in a big loop. And, you know, you go and make a little change and you want to check you can break everything, so you just run this test and get a coffee and come back and, and does not thing. So anyway, uh, we just want to run a single test here. And uh, in, in the scripts we use, if you set VCD equals 1 before you run a simulation, it'll make the VCD done. Um, and so it'll run, it'll do the VCD dump, then you go GTK wave, and everything gets put in this out directory, all on k and basic.vcd. Open that up, and then the system on chip signals are all there for you to see, so you can dump the clock and the reset. And we look at the so the processor you know goes out and fetches instructions. So if we go along and look at where it actually starts doing something. Zoom out. Cool, so he's in reset here. As soon as he comes out of reset, he starts doing something. Uh, zoom in here. So the reset address of open risk is hex 100. He asks for the instruction at hex 100. And off he goes. Uh, 104, 108, 10 c eventually hits a branch instruction that needs to go and fetches this instruction at 1000 and then off he goes executing the rest of the code. So, fair enough, very good. Um, are these the instructions that are in the read? Uh, sorry? Is this, are you working through what's in the read? Uh, in the wiki page. In the yeah, yeah, basically just right. demonstrating that. So, there's also a bit of a trace output you get as well. So we have like a disassembler in Verilog, it's quite, quite ugly. Um, uh, trace. So, uh, you can't really do that one. <laughs> so, there you go. That's a trace of all the instructions that, is, uh, that are being executed. You can see there it starts at 100 and goes on. And Runs the program, runs the program, then it finishes, and you're done. So, that's what the RTL simulation environment gives you. It allows you to do tracing, gives you uh, looks at the waveforms and things like that. Very good.
this software didn't do much. This software just sat here and did a bunch of software tests. Um, there's a link to the actual source file on the, or I'll tell you the path in the actual source file we just ran there on the wiki. It's kind of boring. This is there doing a bunch of like arithmetic, you know, tests. Checking the CPU is the same, basically. Um, we can run something, which is a little bit more accessible here. If you go to run a test call on K Basic. And we can go and look at the whole K Basic code because actually software oh, uh, tests on oh, K okay. sim oh, on okay, K Basic. Huh? Uh, no, oh, okay, simple is the one I meant. Uh, yeah, I already worked through this stuff demo actually. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. The test I ran before was written in assembly, so it's kind of hard to get into. But you can just go and do something like. Um, sorry? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. So I'll see if I can Emacs this and see if it's visible at the back. Can you make Emacs like a lot bigger somehow? Yeah, text properties. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, that's literally a main loop that just returns, right? You can see. So you could, if you wanted to, go in here and tell it to report some other value like A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. And we run that test. Okay, simple. <coughs> and we have that happening. So, um, yeah, this environment basically gives you a, a nice thing where you can go and just write a little C file and it will go and sort everything out for you, load it into the system, do all that. Um, we have, you know, a little sort of printf guy, so you can go, you can go printf, or include printf.h do a bit of the old printf, hello world, the mrkx, mrkx, exclamation mark, new name, everything, uh, oh no, oh <laughs> uh, yeah, what? Just the other one. Okay. So this printf is actually cheating a little bit because it's not using the UART. It's doing a, it's executing a fancy instruction which basically tells the simulator, oh please go and look here to get the character I want to print. It doesn't actually print the thing. Um, we can make it actually print the thing by pulling in the UART driver. Very nice. And we go to UART in it or in it UART, I think maybe. And we're going to use First, you are, and then we're going to go to zero. No, it's you are, yeah, it doesn't work. Do that, and we tell it to dump the VCD. You should see the message at some point. So, this will take a little bit longer now because we're actually simulating UART output from the system. So, the UART is implemented as a, an IP call. So, I can probably go and show you. Uh, actually, it won't look like anything really. I can go on boards. They're doing the generic pronto espresso. That's the old very old top, 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 top. Go and look at. So the UI is instantiated. It's hooked up to the bus. So these are the wires that hook it into the rest of the system. And the actual UI core is here. So it's got like an interface to the bus. So the, the system bus we're using is called the wishbone bus. It's very, very simple. Um, there you go, low world from the MR1KX. And so we now look, we go and look at the uh, oh, okay, simple VCD. It's taking a little bit longer to load because it's quite a big VCD. We simulated the entire system doing some UART output. Um, here. 
go and let's look at the, the UART signals. Very good. So here we can see the UART line. You would have seen this in simulation before. UART line actually transmitting something. So he's sort of transmitting along there. Very nice. But you can see there's a lot of bus activity. So the process is actually sitting there, and every one of these things where the process has gone and read a register means it's polling the IP call. You can see how many times it polls per character. It's just you know hundreds, if not thousands. So that's a bit of a silly use of a processor's time. You can go and make that interrupt driven by going something like where is that test? Software test is too hard. In you are interrupt. Let's see. So this is a little bit of a fancy way to do you um, are TX interrupt as a test on. Anyway, there's a little bit more code here, but essentially it's installing you know interrupt service routine and everything like that. You know anyone who's done any software will know that. You have to go and tell the processor what code to run in the event of an interrupt. So this handles all of that for you. So if you go and run that, you'll then see a different behavior from the processor. Test equals URTX interrupt and we'll dump the VCD. Cool. Dump the VCD. So yeah, this MR1KX environment gives you like a little C library which can do interrupt handling for you. Um, and the environment allows you to simulate and dump waveforms and debug and develop the system. What it also does is saves you from having to use a GUI like Cordis to go and synthesize and download the designs on the board. Um, I'll demonstrate that in a second. So yeah, if you remember what this looks like, this, uh, this UART demo where sitting there there's a ton of bus activity, the process is just reading one bit of memory and wasting a lot of its time. We get another hello world there, so we can load that waveform up, we can see. We'll see that he's been a lot less busy, but achieved essentially the same outcome. Going without all the UART signals. Dump then. Zoom out. Immediately we can see a lot less fast activity. So you compare that to that. Now the process is sitting in. Here we can see the UART line going high. Telling the processor that, hey, I've just transmitted that last byte. Please give me the next one. And all he's doing is about four accesses per byte instead of about four million. So that's a nice little demo. Um, so that's a system bus. You know, it's obvious to see when things are busy and when things are. All right. So. Say I want to build for a board like the D0 Nano. I mean, it's a little bit out of the scope of a day like today, to, and especially for you know the hour a little bit I have to demonstrate how to go about developing your own port for a board. But that is documented on, on the internet. Um, you know, just say you have an FPGA board at home that you want to go and run this stuff on. It's not a great deal of effort to go and achieve that. So we have a directory under boards under Altera D0 Nano where we have everything set up, the RTL. But, um, yeah, if people want to go and look at this as well in the, in the GitHub, it could be uh, instructive to see how the top level of a system on chip is sort of brought together. So I brought that up before. So it just looks just like, you know, I mean, this file is, I mean, how long is this file? It's 1,000 line, thousand lines long. So we're just defining, you know, top level we have JTAG signals coming in, we have the UART signals, we have the GPIO signals, 
We have a clock and a reset. And we declare everything. We have a little clock gen module which will manage resets for us. Because it's a because we want well actually I'm not sure if we instantiate like a fancy clock management block like a PLL, they call DCMs on in Xilinx land. But you know, sometimes you get a 50 megahertz clock and you want to generate like a 33 megahertz clock. You can't exactly just divide it in half or use, you know, the clocking techniques like we used earlier today. So you've got to use uh, a fancy bit of technology that you just hand instantiate and configure. But that's not that hard to do. So that usually all goes in a little clock management block. Then we have the arbiter, the guy who's sort of connecting everything together. So he takes inputs from everyone and sends outputs back to everyone. And you know when the process is requesting an access, he'll figure out if the bus is busy and if it is, he'll make the guy wait. Otherwise, he'll hook him up with the correct sl uh, slave, I guess you'd say, um, on the bus. And then you have instantiations of the JTAG tap. So I'll demonstrate the debugger in a minute. But the debugger comes in and talks via JTAG to the rest of the system, and JTAG accesses get translated, I guess, into wishbone bus accesses. You then got the processor, so he sits here, and then various bits of debug stuff, and UI peripheral, GPIO peripheral, and things like that. So ideally in the top level, it's literally just gluing things together and instantiating. You're not really got any fancy control logic. Um, so that's what the top level looks like. You go here and go sim, quarter run. Go make it clean. Um, I can make the design and program it to my board with this. Make PGM. No, that's not true. Make assemble and then PGM. So that will go and run all the tools by hand. Well, instantiate them on the command line. And that takes about two and a half minutes to then get a design onto the board. Sorry? The little warnings we were told about earlier. Yeah. Thousands of a few warnings in there. Don't worry about them. <laughs> um, so yeah, as you can see, this is a fairly different development flow to the Cordis stuff. To the Cordis IDE at least anyway. Um, typically you would not use the Cordis IDE every time you went to program. You would generate a script once and run it from the command line in sort of batch mode like this. So you had to do a little bit of change in design, simulate, check it's good, and then just press this command and do something else for three minutes and then come back and check that it's worked. Uh, so yeah, this goes on and eventually we get a little programming image or an image that we put onto the board. Um, once it's onto the board, we then actually need to do something with it, I guess. So that's where this open OCD debugger comes in. So if anyone use, has used that before, um, or sorry, if anyone hasn't used that before, the open OCD program is something that talks to the design, basically goes in and, as I said, stalls it, allows you to access the internals. And uh, without it, you're kind of screwed because you can't do much. Um, and of course, you, know, you can't really do much development without a debugger. So it's a critical part of the development flow for software mainly, but you can use these debuggers for hardware debugging as well for certain things. But yeah, I guess at this point, the hardware development ends and the software development sort of takes over. Or the software development slide takes over. So that's doing its thing. You are building and running. So yeah, here are the commands for running synthesis and then programming the board. So once the board's programmed, then yeah, we want to connect the debug proxy. Okay, it's finally got around to programming, and we're done. So I've got a design, it's on there, it's running whatever software that was already on the board. My little demo. Very good. So, uh, once we're on there, 
you want to go and want to go and connect the debug proxy. The debug proxy we're using is OpenOCD, and it knows, like we built the debug proxy to know how to talk to open risk processes. So when the debug proxy connects, it'll um, stall the processor. So that's stopped there because the debug proxy has connected, he's told the system to go on hold. Then I crack out my software debugger, GDB. I'm just going to get a bit of software to run on this guy. So I think this little software test is just something which will make a LED LED go on when uh, interrupt fires from the push button. So we'll go oh, one k elf GDB, and we'll go target remote. The proxy is running on port fifty thousand and uh, and one. So then he's connected. GDB is in there. We can read memory. You know, we can read the instruction at the reset vector. So there we go, that, that looks very nice. We can also read the NPC. So he got up to that instruction before he was stalled. Um, okay, so we go make, we have a bit of software in here called GPI int. Yep, just warning something. And we tell it that we want to use this new GPI int.l file. And I'll load that guy. Cool, so he's just downloaded it to the board, and if we press C, it should be running. If I press the button, prepare for some demo player. Uh, so anyway, this bit of software I think just... Oh yeah, demo file. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there we go. So, press push button and LED comes on because it detected a falling edge interrupt and it should turn it off when it detects a rising edge interrupt. Should it turn off? Yeah. Alright, so that's that, that little bit of code that I just ran is, um, yeah it's in there, it's just a little thing to demonstrate how to set up interrupts from the GPIO controller in this guy. And I just demonstrated how to sort of get in there and load the software. Um, the only thing left to do, I guess, is go and do something more fancy, which is kind of... So, this bit of software that I just gave you, or sorry, the image I gave you before, is running this bit of software. So it's a bit of software which talks to the accelerometer on the board, uh, ah, very good. Yeah, people figured out how to program it onto the board, I guess, right? Quarters, all of this, and then it just says, like, do you want to stick this into the flash on the board, right? Something like that. Perfect. Perfect. So, actually, these tools will generate that image for you uh, very simply, and. Um, that's how I did it before, so it's sort of really easy to do. No, not much magic involved. So I just made that bit of software. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you guys have this on your board now, you can you'll be able to see what I can see. Um, so I tell it that I want to use that file I just built. Uh huh. Uh, I'll load it on the board. It's done. I tell it to run. So now you should see it running. So the first mode that it's in, uh, it's using the accelerometer to detect taps, a double tap. And if I go and load up the software, yeah, if you're tapping twice, you should see the the pattern change. So boards. 
out. Zero. T zero nine software tests for the simple. Yeah, so we're talking over the SPI. So the software is under the simple SPI directory and board. And it's the simple SPI ADXL345, which is the model of the accelerometer. Fancy. <laughs> Alright. Um, so you can see here in the code, and again, I don't know how to make this any. It's not magnify, is it? No, that's search. Anyway, there's a little configuration C function here where you can program the like the threshold and the time between the taps and everything. And this just goes and sets values in the register on the device. Um, anyway, so you can tell to do something else. So anyway, I've also got an interrupt with the push button install. So if you press here, if you press press push button one, it'll directly dump samples from the accelerometer onto the LEDs. So if you shake it, you should see higher numbers coming out on the LEDs, I hope. And it's actually configured to measure it only in the x direction. So if you shake it like this, which is the z axis on the accelerometer, it shouldn't do as much as this. Same with that way, that's the y axis. Um, it shouldn't do as much as that. Anyway, so that's kind of cool. The other one that I've got going is one which tells you the orientation of the board. So it tells you which an LED will light up depending on which of the six axes is, is closest to the ground. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, it's uh, you can make it quite sensitive. So, um, yeah, you, you could do a nice little spirit level application or something. <laughs> It'll just level out. And get all the yeah, seventy pound at spirit level, <laughs> but you need the power. Right. Uh, so they're the demos I had prepared for today. Um, all the software is on here, so. It would have been nice if we could have sort of more people playing along and using it. Um, but hopefully it's something that you geared up to do at home now. And uh, as I said, there's a lot of instruction on the website, on the wiki, and all the software is sort of in here to be able to go on at least interface to the accelerometer by SPI and use the GPIOs and interrupts and things. So I thought that was a nice little system demo of this guy. But of course, if you do that, it goes back. And Ask it to change pattern again. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, yeah, everyone should have a flash on their board now, right? Should be pretty easy. Pretty easy to do. You done? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> okay. Well, who's who's battling away trying to get this working? No one. Yeah, I'd kind of. Let you all cheat by giving you the image, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Judith. Yeah, yeah. Um,